This is the 2022 Hyundai Elantra N, and it's a high-performance compact sedan. It's also a bit of a surprise. 276 horsepower, a manual transmission, a Subaru WRX rival from Hyundai. Today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era, now with free listings. You can list your car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And we've had some great sales recently, including this fantastic Mercedes E63 AMG wagon, which sold for just over $40,000. This wonderful Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT8 with a massive amount of modifications brought $30,000. and. This great Nissan GTR sold for $62,000. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s to now, Cars and Bids is the place to do it with daily auctions and great selection at carsandbids.com. So let's talk Elantra N. Hyundai has made great competitive cars for a while now, but generally speaking, they haven't been very exciting cars. But that is starting to change with the addition of Hyundai's new N performance brand. First, there was the Veloster N, the hot hatchback, and now there's this, the Elantra N, which looks to be a competitor for the Subaru WRX and the Volkswagen GTI and GLI. Now, like I said, 276 horsepower, which is a pretty good figure considering the new Subaru WRX only has 271. You can get the Elantra N with a six-speed manual transmission, which this car has, or with a dual-clutch automatic, and pricing starts around $33,000. Zero to 60 is about 5.3 seconds, and unfortunately, this car is only available with front-wheel drive. But today, I'm going to review the Elantra N and see just how much that matters. First, I will take you on a thorough tour of this car and show you all of its quirks and features, then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Elantra N by going over all of the upgrades compared to a standard Elantra. And I'm going to start on the outside where there are quite a few. Probably the most noticeable is this red trim going along the side of this car, this like lower rocker panel area. And it continues all the way to the front as well. And the entire front below the bumper, this red trim spanning the entire side and front of the Elantra N. Also on the side and also very noticeable, these wheels. These are 19 inch wheels, obviously larger than what you get on a standard Elantra, and they make way for larger brakes, as you can see, with red painted brake calipers both front and back to give this car an especially sporty appearance. These 19 inch wheels also come on Michelin Pilot Sport tires, which is a pretty aggressive, high performance tire. <laughs> Just a few years ago, it would have been crazy to imagine such a tire coming from the factory on a Hyundai. Also, one other nice upgrade on the side of the Elantra N compared to most Elantra models is the trim is painted black. This trim around the windows going down the side of the car, not just sort of a cheap looking plastic, but gloss black, which definitely gives it a higher quality feel to it. But anyway, next up, we're going to the front of the Elantra N, which is also far more aggressive than a regular Elantra model. For one thing, the grille design is different. It's about the same size and shape, but it has sort of a more aggressive pattern to it, or so Hyundai thinks. And you can also see there is an N logo in the grille to further distinguish this from a standard Elantra model. But probably the most noticeable change to the front of this car to make it more aggressive and sporty, these panels here on the sides of the front grille, you can see these big black panels panels, which are intended to convey kind of a performance muscly look. Now, interestingly, the majority of these panels are fake. You can see they don't really do anything. They're just a plastic panel in there for style. Although you do have a little piece at the side where air can pass through. Presumably it has some small benefit for aerodynamics, but mostly these are just here for style, purely cosmetic, but they do have an effect on making the front of this car look more aggressive and sporty than a regular Elantra. So I guess it worked. But anyway, next up, 
moving around back in the Elantra N. Quite a few changes back here to give it a sportier and more aggressive look than a standard Elantra. Two especially noticeable ones. One is the rear diffuser. You can see it is quite large and quite performance car-like, and it also includes this little red trim strip that you had on the sides and the front like I showed you. So you have that basically going around the entire car near the bottom, this thin red line to give it an extra sporty look. Now, another noticeable sporty upgrade back here is this wing, which is quite large. You have it stuck to the trunk. You can see it actually raises up a couple of inches, and it's even a different color from the car to really help it stand out and emphasize that it is a big rear wing. Not all cars in this segment have a wing like this, but the Elantra N, like I said, has quite a few performancey changes on the outside. One other big one back here, uh, dual exhaust. You can see integrated into the rear diffuser back here, dual exhausts, and they are large, exactly what you'd expect from a performance car like the Elantra N. Now, all of these changes I've mentioned on the outside of this car, both back here and the rest of the Elantra N, are quite comprehensive. And I promise you, when you see one of these on the street, you will not mistake the Elantra N for just a standard Elantra, especially if you get it in this color. This is called Performance Blue, and it's sort of like the N color. It's the launch color for the Veloster N and for this car, and it's certainly the N brand's most distinctive color, and Hyundai has pushed it pretty hard in press cars and advertising materials, and it does look cool. With all that said, even with all these exterior changes to this car, I wish they had gone just a little bit further. Most of the upgrades for the Elantra N are like bolt-ons, a different front fascia, different wheels, a rear spoiler, but Subaru carefully pointed out to me that the new WRX has a completely different body from the standard Impreza for better or worse, but one of the benefits of that is it has these big flared fenders which just look cool, and I think that would help this car stand out even more. If you had some nice fender flares to give it an even sportier look compared to some easier changes to make cosmetically. But anyway, next we move inside the Elantra N, and I'm gonna go through all of the N upgrades in here, starting with, before you even get inside, the key. On one side it looks normal, but you flip it over and you do have a little N logo there, and kudos to Hyundai for doing that. Most cars at this price point, even performance cars, they just give you a regular key. This one is a little more distinctive. Now, when you open the door, you can see a little N logo in the silver sill plate, which looks kind of cool. And the floor mat is a regular Elantra floor mat, but with an N badge actually tacked on there, like a metal badge below the simple Elantra stitched into the floor mat, which is kind of an interesting look. Now, when you first get into this car, probably the biggest change you notice compared to a standard Elantra is the seats, which really are sport seats. You can see they're thickly bolstered both on the backrest and on the bottom. They really do look like sporty performance car seats. They even have little holes, a little pass-through below the headrest that you can use to stick in a racing harness, which you don't see too often on a car like this, and you certainly don't get on a regular Elantra. They're also finished in Alcantara, just like most car companies' high-performance car sport seats. They really did go all out making these seats very sporty. One other cool touch of these seats, the N badge, as you can see, is right here below the headrest. That's not all that unusual. The cool part is it lights up. Take a look at it at night. You can see the N actually lights up. BMW M does this on their seats, too. It's kind of a neat touch. And now the Hyundai Elantra N has it as well. It's certainly a distinctive look. But, of course, there are far more N changes in this car than just a few badges and the seats. One is the stitching. Performance blue stitching to match the exterior. You can see it here on the base of the gear lever. Looks kind of cool. You can also see it on the seats. A lot of performance blue stitching match on the outside. And you have performance blue stitching on the steering wheel, as you can see. Steering wheel, by the way, very nice. Leather wrapped and feels nice and thick good for performance driving, and there are quite a few N changes on the steering wheel. For one thing, you can see two separate N buttons. They are finished in performance blue. One has the N colored in, and the other one doesn't. It leaves the N blank. Two different steering wheel N buttons. So what do they do? The one on the left with the N blank, that changes your drive mode. You push that and you can switch between like an eco mode, a normal, and then sport mode. That's intentional 
intended to be a shortcut to the drive mode right at your fingertips on the steering wheel, although I must say it's not much of a shortcut because the regular drive mode button is down here in the center console, a short press away. But if you can't be bothered to reach all the way down there, you can just change the drive mode on the left side of your steering wheel. Now, the N button on the right side of your steering wheel, the one with N colored in, if you push that, it will go into N mode, which is like a special high performance mode that's more aggressive than any of the regular drive modes. And when you go into that N mode, in addition to the steering tightening up and the throttle response improving and the exhaust sound opening up, you also get a change to the gauge cluster screen. You can see it here, a more aggressive screen that prioritizes the tachometer right in the middle, along with several gauges next to the tachometer that might be important when you're on the racetrack. You can see them in large print, including a boost gauge and a gauge that shows your exact torque you're using right now. On this screen, you can see the speedometer is actually minimized quite a bit. That's because this is for track use and you don't really need your speedometer on the racetrack. Now, if you press that end button one more time, it will enter into your custom drive mode, which you can configure. And I'll get to that in a second when I cover the center screen. Other interesting items on the steering wheel, for one thing, there is of course an N badge at the bottom. You see the theme here, a lot of N badging in this car. And you also have a little button marked rev. If you press that, it turns on rev matching, which is a neat feature to see in a car like this. This price point, you don't always get that, but you do here with this big red button. Now, speaking of rev matching in this car, you do have a manual transmission in here, as you can see. And yes, there is an N logo at the top of the gear lever. <laughs> Again, another N logo in here. Now, having the manual in this car is actually a pretty big deal because you can't get a manual transmission in a base level Elantra. They come standard with the CVT. There is an Elantra model offered with a manual transmission. It's called the N line, and it's sort of a cooled off version of this car, but a regular standard Elantra is automatic only. <laughs> you gotta get the performance versions to get three pedals. Of course, if you don't want a manual, like I mentioned earlier, a dual clutch automatic is also available. Truthfully though, it's impressive to see a manual transmission in a car like this, and I wasn't expecting it. I really thought they would go dual clutch only for this car, but they didn't. It seems to me that Hyundai really benchmarked the Subaru WRX when creating this car, and that vehicle is about 80% manual transmission sales. So if you really wanted to compete against it, you had to have a manual, and so they do. But anyway, those are most of the N upgrades in this interior. Next up, let's move on to some other quirks and features in here, starting with the quirkiest quirk, which is this panel to the left of the gauge cluster. You can see has a little circle on it with a line in the center. What the hell is that? I couldn't figure it out. I asked Hyundai and they told me it is purely decorative. What they said was this is intended to balance out the look of the large screens next to it. Having this panel here, I guess, doesn't make it so the large screen panel is so overwhelming. But why is there a circle on it with a dash that... <laughs> It's just decorative. We will never know. Now, that is Hyundai's official answer regarding this panel, but I think there's more to this story. A lot of cars are adding little touch screens over here to the left of the gauge cluster, and I suspect that maybe in a refresh of this car, they're gonna do that too, and so they wanted to stick that panel here maybe as a placeholder until they did it, <laughs> because otherwise it's just really, really bizarre. By the way, also in this vicinity, worth noting below that weird panel, you can see the traction control off button. If you press that, it goes into something of a sport traction control where it's not fully off, but it's mostly off to allow you to have fun. However, if you hold it down, it can be fully defeated and turn completely off, and then you're on your own in the Elantra N. But anyway, back to the screens. I want to start with this center screen, the infotainment screen in the middle, which is frankly a little bit of a disappointment. It works easily enough. It's intuitive and it responds to your touches and that all is pretty simple. But truthfully, it's just not big enough. And that becomes a problem in several areas. For instance, you listen to the radio and you can see your presets are actually part of the screen, which wouldn't be so bad, except if you're on the navigation map, well, then you've lost your radio presets. So if you wanna select a different radio station you have preset when your navigation map is up, you have to go back to the radio, press the preset, and then go back to the map every single time you wanna change 
between your radio presets. Now, I know you can change between the presets on the steering wheel, but you have to go one at a time. And of course, the passenger doesn't have any access to that, just the driver. So this isn't really a great setup. More and more of these cars are adding larger screens that can do multiple things at once, and this car gives a good example of frankly, why you need that. Now, with that said, one thing I absolutely love in this center screen is the N screen. You tap on that and you're given like a performance screen and you can see a lot of cool things on here. For one, you have this supplementary tachometer, which looks kind of cool. You can always have that up if you want. You also have other instantaneous gauges here showing you brake pressure, throttle pressure, and various other items, which is nice to have. You also have a lap timer on here, a stopwatch where you can start and stop to measure your laps and you can even select a circuit on here the racetrack that you're on although when you click on that it only gives you a few different racetrack options that have been preloaded but the point is they are there which is a lot to say for a Hyundai Elantra now interestingly there is a second page of this and menu and if you scroll over to that you can see this is where you set up your custom drive mode and there are a lot of different things you can configure for this drive mode of course you can adjust the steering the throttle response that stuff's pretty standard but you can also change the engine sound you can choose between three different exhaust notes in your custom mode and they are quite distinct take a listen to the normal mode in this car Okay, now take a listen to the first sport mode for the exhaust. Okay, and finally, this is Sport Plus, sort of the highest level of performance from the exhaust sound. So that's a pretty cool item that you can configure in your custom mode, but check this out. You can also configure your rev matching. You can choose between three different levels of rev matching aggressiveness, which is really unusual. That's not something you can usually configure even in really expensive sports cars. You also have a launch control here, and you can even configure which RPM launch control will be active at. And you can select the RPM for your shift light to come on as well well. The shift light is built into the gauge cluster screen and it really comes on strong when you're hitting it, letting you know it's time to shift. And that's a cool feature that, again, you don't get in even a lot of performance cars that are really expensive, but you get it here and you can choose when it comes on. And next up, speaking of the gauge cluster screen with that shift light, let's talk about this screen. This is relatively similar to the gauge cluster screen you get in other Hyundai models and it works reasonably well. You can see it's pretty configurable and it does a nice little change when you switch drive modes, as you can see here, gives you kind of different images to represent the modes. However, there are some annoyances in here as well, just like in the center screen. For one, you can't pull up the music you're currently playing in your gauge cluster screen. I have no idea why every other car has this, but not Hyundai and Kia models with this screen. It's just not available there. And disappointingly, you can't get a navigation map in here either. When you don't have directions active, all you can get is a compass in this screen and when you do have directions you can see it's a fairly rudimentary navigation system that kind of just shows arrows where you're supposed to turn again no map function here not sure why they don't do that since they have this high quality gauge cluster screen and since so many other brands do but they don't also one other little disappointment here with this gauge cluster screen you do not get the blind spot camera system like you do in other Hyundai and Kia models and other models if you put on your turn signal a camera will turn on in your gauge cluster to show you what's in your blind spot. It's not here. I guess it's not available in the Elantra, which is fine at the like $24,000 base level Elantra price point. But this car in the mid 30s, it's a feature that would be nice to have, but you don't have it. And next up, we move on to the back seat in the Elantra N, where I have some similar comments about a few features it would be nice to see at this price point. For one thing, there's no heated rear seats. That you can live with. It's an economy car and it makes sense, but you also don't have any charge ports back here. No 
charging at all for devices, and it's a little bit more disappointing. No climate control vents back here. You can see nothing at all. Even though it looks like there's a blank on the back of the front center console where climate control vents could be, they're not here in this car. Probably most surprisingly, you don't even have a rear center armrest back here. Nothing folds down from the center of the seat, which means not only do you not get an armrest, but you don't get cup holders, which is kind of a disappointment sitting in the back of the car. Rear passengers don't have anywhere to put their cups. And as cool as these front sport seats are, they do kind of rob rear seat legroom because they're very hard and fixed. So if you're sitting back here, your knees can't really push into like a leather or cloth seat. Instead, they're going right up against this hard backed sport seat, which eliminates some space. However, I should point out this pretty decent space in the back of this car. This seat is in a pretty standard position. I'm sitting back here and I don't really need to dig my knees into it in order to get knee space. So that's not a huge problem. Headroom also is quite good, better than in a lot of compact cars that are increasingly adding sloped roofs to steel rear headroom. In this car, it is ample as far as headspace. And I also like the fact that the rear seat keeps the materials from the front seat. This Alcantara, it's an expensive material to add and to put in the back seat, which isn't going to be used as often, but it's here and it certainly makes the back look classy along with the nice performance blue stitching just like up front. So it's nice that they preserve those materials, but it would be better if they added just a few more features back here, cup holders and chargers especially. But anyway, next up we move on to the cargo area, the trunk in the Elantra N, which has a couple of interesting quirks, one of which is just getting into the trunk. They've hidden the trunk popper in this black trim piece back here. So you don't see any obvious or ugly trunk popper, but it's still pretty high up, so you can easily access it. So anyway, you press the little button and the trunk pops open and you can see, well, nothing particularly interesting in this trunk. It just looks like a normal trunk, not all that weird or unusual, except if you look all the way to the back of it, you can see these red bars going across the rear of the trunk. Those are specific to the Elantra N, the high performance version, and they add chassis rigidity. A lot of cars have stuff like this and this car does too. The interesting thing is the rear seat still folds down. So you can fold down the rear seat. You pull on these little tabs in the trunk to unlock it, and then you fold it down, and then you have a pass-through from the trunk to the interior, but there are bars blocking it. So you could still use it as long as the long item you want to stick in your trunk is kind of weirdly shaped to go around those bars. By the way, one other disappointing cost-cutting item in this car, the folding rear seat is not split folding, meaning that if you want to fold down the back seat, you got to fold the entire thing at once. This is especially disappointing if you want to carry some large item and a rear passenger. You can't do both. You have to choose. Most cars, even at this price point, have a split folding rear seat. And finally, we move under the hood in the Elantra N, and you can see the engine and this engine cover that says N Turbo flanked by eight lines in a V, reminding you that this car has a turbo V8. Except, of course, it doesn't. It has a turbo four-cylinder, and I'm not sure why they tried to make it look like it has a V8, but that is just style. Anyway, two-liter turbo four-cylinder in this car makes about 276 horsepower with the manual transmission, or if you go for the dual-clutch automatic, you can get 10 more horsepower thanks to like an over-boost function, brings things up to 286. Now, that is a pretty strong number for a car like this, especially when you consider the WRX is at 271. The Volkswagen GLI and GTI are at like 230, I think. This thing is way, way stronger, at least in terms of power. It's got a lot of muscle under here. But ultimately, even though it has more power than its rivals, 276, 286 horses, front wheel drive. So just under 300 horsepower in front wheel drive. How exactly does that shake down on the road? Let's find out. Time to drive the Hyundai Elantra N. All right, driving the new Elantra N. This is a very interesting car to me. 
because this is a lot of my viewers are in this space the like mid thirty thousand dollar car world buying like a performance car but still need some practicality and thus a sedan and the wrx it just so happens a new one has just come out and i've driven it only a couple days before this which will be a good comparison point so let's just start in with that comparison. Uh, and interesting thing, I have had to drive this car in the rain the last few days. Don't get a lot of rain here in San Diego, but we have this week. And I also drove the new WRX in heavy rain. <laughs> and the comparison is quite interesting between the two cars. Namely, it really gives you an example of why the WRX is so at home in that environment and it shows some of the benefits of all-wheel drive. This car in the rain, you floor it and you got wheel hop for centuries. In fact, I felt some wheel hop that was so bad I wondered if I had broken something because it just was not capable of handling any sort of slippage up front in the rain. And of course, the WRX being all-wheel drive handles that masterfully. Uh, and I think that alone will probably sell a lot of people on the WRX. A lot of people are skeptical of this car being front-wheel drive to begin with. And when you hear there are actual differences, and I felt the actual differences driving them around, you instantly understand the benefits of all-wheel drive. That's especially true because this car is not dramatically cheaper than a WRX. As I film this video, the launch will end. Subaru still hasn't announced pricing for the WRX, but just based on where it was priced before I imagine it'll be a little bit more expensive but I can't imagine it's gonna be so expensive that it starts to make this car at thirty three thousand dollars look like a real bargain and I think that's kind of the problem with this car on paper it does seem like a bargain 276 horsepower a lot of cool tech in this car some upgrades on the outside bigger wheels pilot sports I mean manual transmission or a dual clutch with even more power there's a lot of stuff to like but when you actually get up close with this car you do start to notice a few things drop out a little bit and are a little bit disappointing. Now, that all-weather traction thing is one. If you drive somewhere frequently with um, not that great of a climate, you're dealing with rain or snow a lot, the WRX simply allows you to have more of a performance car experience more of the year. And so that alone is a big benefit of that car, but it isn't just that. Steering and handling. WRX is so light on its feet. You know, I wanted to not like the WRX because on paper, it doesn't look like that great of a car. It's uglier than before. Power has an increase and I'm like how is this going to be good but the way they make it good is the is the stuff you can't put on paper the way it feels on the road the way it accelerates how it drives and this car's steering and handling capabilities just aren't quite on the level of the WRX steering is tight it has a tight steering feel to it but that doesn't necessarily translate to fantastic handling when you're running hard around corners you do feel some understeer now I gotta say as far as the powertrain is concerned I really like this car's powertrain I mean mentioned when I was reviewing the WRX that I like turbo engines that don't feel turbo, like they have good power at all parts of the range, and this is that. It certainly feels like that. But I think I like the WRX's powertrain even more. There are things about this car that I like better, and one huge one is the way it looks. The WRX is actually ugly. This car is actually attractive. Like, <laughs> this is a nice looking car, and so that is a benefit of this car. The tech in this car is clearly better than Subaru. I complained about the infotainment system not being able to do two things at once. Well, the WRX has a much larger screen, and you still can't do two things at once. It's confounding. This car has a better uh, gauge cluster display screen, and it has a few more features that the WRX doesn't have. It feels like a more modern car. The WRX is starting to feel dated. And the interior in here, frankly, is a little nicer than it is in the WRX. The materials are a little bit better, and everything just seems a little bit more modern and a little bit better thought out. It's just not Subaru's forte for whatever reason. This is a great second N car, you know, after the Veloster N and Hyundai's lineup, and it's cool and it's fun but it's just hard to unseat the champion, even when the champion is heinous, <laughs> like the WRX is. I like this car a lot, but I would probably buy the Subaru unless I really hated how it looked, or unless I got a really good deal on this car and Subaru just couldn't match it, which is certainly possible given the WRX will probably have higher demand. And so that's the Hyundai Elantra N. Now that Hyundai has established itself as a true competitor to all the major brands, Toyota, Honda, Ford, General Motors, they can start going after the enthusiasts. And this car is a pretty good start. And now it's time to give the Elantra N a Doug score.
And the Doug score is here, 56 out of 100, which places the Elantra N in some surprisingly decent company. It's just behind the WRX, which I wasn't expecting. I enjoy driving the WRX more, but the Elantra N has some nice benefits, including reasonable pricing, big power, good tech, and Hyundai's great warranty. Plus, the Elantra is better looking. I'd still rather have a WRX from a purely driving perspective, but I could understand why someone might buy the Hyundai. There's something I truly never thought I'd hear myself say, and it helps to explain just how competitive the Elantra N really is, even though it's Hyundai's first real shot at this segment. <laughs> 